All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Time to continue our series in the Lost Wisdom of the Ages. The Wisdom of the Pharaohs, as it has been called before, but also the Kabbalion Hermetic Philosophy. Thank you for joining me, ladies and gentlemen. Today we find ourselves on chapter number one, entitled The Hermetic Philosophy. The lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding. After the years rolled by, after the passing from this plane of life, tradition recorded that he lived almost 300 years in the flesh. The Egyptians deified Hermes and made him one of their gods under the name of Thoth. T-H-O-T-H, sometimes pronounced Tahath or Thoth, Thoth. Years after, the people of ancient Greece also made him one of their many gods, calling him Hermes, the god of wisdom. The Egyptians revered his memory for many centuries, yes, tens of centuries, calling him the scribe of the gods and bestowing upon him distinctively his ancient title, Tris Majestus, which means the thrice great, the great great, the greatest great, three times the greatest in all ancient lands. The name of Hermes Tris Majestus was revered, and the name being synonymous with the fount of wisdom. With the fount of wisdom, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me. Once again, we're reading from the Kabbalion, continuing our series. We've done all of the, both of the introductions so far, and now we find ourselves on chapter number one, the Hermetic Philosophy, reading for purposes of teaching and commentary and expanding the mind so that through this increased awareness and understanding of the nature of ourselves and of the things that are, as Hermes called it in the Corpus Hermeticum, the nature of reality, the things that are. So that through this increased awareness, we can increase, hopefully, the quality of our lives. The kitten's coming to say hello like usual. Ouch. <laughs> no, you can't get that. That's not a string, Beans. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. One sec here. All right, ladies and gentlemen. The Hermetic Philosophy, Chapter 1, begins. From old Egypt have come the fundamental and esoteric occult teachings which have stro so strongly influenced the philosophies of all races, nations, peoples, for several thousand years. <laughs> the kitten. But Egypt, the home of the pyramids, and the Sphinx was the birthplace of the hidden wisdom and mystic teachings. From her secret doctrine, all nations have borrowed. India, Persia, Chaldea, Media, China, Japan, Assyria. Ancient Greece and Rome and other ancient countries partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge, which the Hierophants, masters of the land devices, so freely provided for those who came prepared to partake of the great store of mystic and occult lore, which the masterminds of that ancient land had gathered together. And it makes me wonder where it came from. And, you know, the previous golden age is instantly where my mind goes to. And this, this being the last surviving place, possibly, of this ancient knowledge, the lost wisdom of the ages, ladies and gentlemen. Which is funny because <clears throat> about a year and a half ago when I started doing videos weekly on this channel, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we started... Doing Tuesday, Dow, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, Living the Wisdom of the Dow. And 
we've been going back to that lately, but we also did on Wednesdays, called it Wednesday Wisdom, the Wisdom of the Ages. And I found, as Dr. Dyer went through tons of different essays from different, uh, uh, you know, a collection of the greatest minds, philosophers, mystics, poets, sages of our times, that there seems to be this understanding of what I like to describe as the lost wisdom of the ages. And this being the greatest, the greatest, um, you know, way of describing that lost wisdom is hermetics. Now, with that being said, that's just my own opinion. And I'd love to hear what you think, ladies and gentlemen, in the comments section below. In ancient Egypt dwelt the great adepts and masters who have never been surpassed and who seldom have been equaled. During the centuries that have taken their processional flight since the days of great Hermes, in Egypt was located the great lodge of lodges of the mystics. At the doors of her temples entered the neophytes who afterward, as hierophants, adepts and masters, traveled to the four corners of the earth, carrying with them the precious knowledge which they were ready, anxious and willing to pass on to those who were ready to receive the same. Remember the quote, the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. Except to the ears of understanding. <clears throat> and so all students of the occult recognize the debt that they owe to these venerable masters of that ancient land. At least we should. And I think we need to change the name occult. I think it's throwing people off. This knowledge is far more important than being for, you know, being hidden, occulted, you know, for a select few esoteric. <clears throat> Anyways, recognize this debt that we owe to the venerable masters of this ancient land. But among these great masters of ancient Egypt, there once dwelt one of whom masters hailed as the master of masters. This man, if man indeed he was, which is a great debate. I'd love to hear your thought on that. Do you think Hermes or Thoth was an actual physical human being, just a physical being and maybe not human for a time, or is it just a spiritual deity, non-physical? I'd love to hear what you think about that, ladies and gentlemen. But here we get from William Walker Atkinson, or Three Initiates in the Kabbalion, this description the master of masters, if this man, indeed, if he was a man, dwelt in Egypt in the earliest days, and he was known as Hermes Trismegistus. He was the father of the occult wisdom, the founder of astrology, the discoverer of alchemy. The details of his life story are lost to history. The lost story of Hermes Trismegistus in the Hermetic philosophy. However, the founder of astrology and discoverer of alchemy, that's big time. That's big time to put it lightly, ladies and gentlemen. Lost to history, owing to the lapse of years through several of the ancient countries disputed with each other in their claims to the honor of having furnished his birthplace. And the thousands of and this thousands of years ago, the date of his sojourn in Egypt, and that his last incarnation on this planet is not now known. 
but it has been fixed at the early days of the oldest dynasties of Egypt, long before the days of Moses. That's good to know. I've often wondered kind of just uh, maybe a random guess at a time frame. But very interesting there. His incarnation, that hit the... That his last incarnation, see, that makes me think of the traditions, the you know, the Buddhist traditions of the avatars and their reincarnations many, many times. And each time that these avatars incarnate, they have an effect on humanity for the better. An increase in consciousness, possibly. But is this how it goes for all great masters of all great spiritual traditions or wisdom traditions, spiritual philosophies? I'd love to know what you think, ladies and gentlemen. The details lost to history. Thousands of years ago, the oldest dynasties of Egypt the best authorities regard him as a contemporary of Abraham. A contemporary. And some of the Jewish traditions go so far as to claim that Abraham acquired a portion of his mystic knowledge from Hermes himself. The Kabbalah? Kabbalion? I don't know. See, it's important to remember that this is more recent, you know, uh, written by somebody who's talking about hermetic philosophy. So keep that in mind. But as we began with earlier, as the years rolled on after the passing, after his passing from this plane of life, the Egyptians deified Hermes and made him one of their gods under the name of Thoth. Tahat. Years after, the people of ancient Greece also made him one of their many gods, calling him Hermes, the god of wisdom. Wisdom? Wisdom, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the Egyptians revered his memory for many centuries, tens of centuries, calling him the scribe of the gods. Even to this day, ladies and gentlemen, we use the term hermetic in the sense of secret or, more commonly known, sealed, hermetic seal, sealed so that nothing can escape, etc. And this by reason of the fact that the followers of Hermes always observed the principle of secrecy in their teachings. Which makes me question whether or not I should have done any of these series on the Hermetica or the Corpus Hermeticum. But, as I was just saying earlier, the, ad the adepts and the masters would travel and take this to distant lands for those, see, yeah, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but the Purifants and the masters of the land of Isis would travel to ancient, other ancient countries who partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge, which was shared freely and provided for those who came prepared to partake of the great store of mystic and occult lore, which the masterminds of that ancient land had gathered. And so we recognize and owe a debt to those venerable masters of that ancient land who gave us this opportunity. So with that being said, we are honoring that. But by reason of the fact that the followers of Hermes always observed the principle of secrecy in their teachings. See, kind of contradictory there. They did not believe in casting, quote-unquote, pearls before swine. But see, that's a biblical quote. But rather, held to the teaching, milk for babes, meat for strong men, both of which maxims are familiar to readers of the Christian scriptures. 
but both of which had been used by the Egyptians for centuries before the Christian era. Now, if you've been here before, you know that we realize that the Christian canon story is a, um, a plagiarism. Put it bluntly, or to put it mildly, it's a, uh, I guess flattery is the highest compliment when, you know, when you're stealing something. Anyways, you get what I'm saying with that. <laughs> mm, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, just trying to be a little, I like to try to keep it light. This can be serious, and some people can get you know, I can take this too seriously and become too focused on one side or the other. It's important to be kind of detached and have an open perspective. So, with that being said, uh, both of which maxims are familiar to readers of the Christian scriptures, but which had been used by the Egyptians for centuries before the Christian era. And this policy of careful dissemination of the truth has always characterized the Hermetics, even unto the present day. The Hermetic teachings are to be found in all lands, among all religions, but never identified with any particular country, nor with any particular religious sect. This, because of the warning of the ancient teachers against allowing the secret doctrine to become crystallized into a creed. The wisdom of this caution is apparent to all students of history. The ancient occultism of India and Persia degenerated and was largely lost, owing to the fact that the teachers became priests and so mixed theology with the philosophy the result being that the occultism of India and Persia has been gradually lost amidst the mass of religious superstitions, cults, creeds, and quote-unquote gods. So it was with the ancient Romans and in Greece. So it was with the hermetic teachings of the Gnostics and the early Christians which were lost at the time of Constantine, whose iron hand smothered philosophy with a thick blanket. This is a very sad part of the history to me. Smothered the pure philosophy, the real truth, the real understanding, with a thick blanket of theology, losing to the Christian church that which was its very essence and spirit, causing it to grope throughout several centuries before it found the way back to its ancient faith. The indications apparent to all careful observers in this 20th century being that the church is now struggling to get back to its ancient mystic foundations. But there were always a few faithful souls who kept alive the flame, tending it carefully, and not allowing its light to become extinguished. And thanks to these staunch hearts and fearless minds, we have the truth still with us here today, ladies and gentlemen. But it is not found in books to any great extent. It has been passed along from master to student, from initiate to hierophant. Hierophant? H-I-E-R-O-P-H-A-N-T. From master to student, from initiate to hierophant, from lip to ear. When it was written down at all, its meaning was veiled in terms of alchemy and astrology, so that only those that possess the key, the contemplation, could read it right. This was made necessary in order to avoid the persecutions of the theologians of the Middle Ages who fought the secret doctrine with fire and with sword and with stake 
gibbet, and cross. And even to this day there will be found but few reliable books on the Hermetic philosophy. Although there are countless references to it in many books written on various phases of occultism, and yet the Hermetic philosophy is the only master key in which will open all the doors of the occult teachings. All right, there's only a page left. I thought I might stop there, but let's finish it up real quick, ladies and gentlemen. This has been The Hermetic Philosophy, Chapter 1, Kabbalion. In the early days, there was a compilation of certain basic hermetic doctrines passed on from teacher to student, which was known as the Kabbalion. The exact significance and meaning of the terms that have been lost for several centuries. That's where it ends the sentence, that's odd. which known as the Kabbalah and the exact significance and meaning of the terms have been lost for several centuries. This teaching, however, is known to many to whom it has descended from mouth to ear. On and on throughout the centuries, it precepts, its precepts have never been written down or printed so far as we know. It, it was merely a collection of maxims and axioms and precepts which were non-understandable really to outsiders but which were readily understood by students after the axioms and maxims and precepts have been explained and exemplified by the hermetic initiates to their neophytes these teachings really constituted the basic principles of the art of hermetic alchemy which contrary to the general belief dealt in the mastery of mental forces rather than material elements. The transmutation of one kind of mental vibrations into the others. Instead of changing, you know, lead into gold or one kind of metal into another, the legends of the quote-unquote philosopher's stone which would turn base metal into gold, was an allegory relating to hermetic philosophy readily understood by all students of true and pure philosophy, true hermeticism. Now, before we finish up, I want to remind us here, because this is perfect, talking about this pure philosophy. Remember, in the first words, of Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, his first book in the Corpus Hermeticum. He says, Oh, my son, write this first book both for humanity's sake and for reverence and honor towards Atum, the one God. For there can be no religion, spiritual pursuit, quote unquote, more true or just than to know the things that are. And to acknowledge thanks for all things and to that which have made them. Which thing we shall not cease continually to do. Knowing that, we look at the first words of the Hermetica, Lost Wisdom of the Pharaohs. And Hermes tells us there, in the prophecies of Hermes, he says, a pure philosophy. So we're talking about this pure philosophy here being hidden those who are not ready? I don't know. But pure philosophy is a spiritual striving through a constant contemplation. I don't know if I can get that right. To attain true knowledge of Atum, the one God. A spiritual striving through a constant contemplation. That is pure philosophy. So keeping that in mind when it's talking about things like the wisdom can come apparent to, you know, when it's saying things, well, let me find it. 
the Philosopher's Stone, which would turn this allegory relating to Hermetic philosophy, which is readily understood by all students of true Hermeticism. So when you're wondering, what does it mean of being a student of true Hermeticism? It's like, well, a pure philosophy is a spiritual striving through a constant contemplation to attain true knowledge of Atum, the one God. And as described in the Corpus Hermeticum, the things that are. There can be no spiritual pursuit more true or just a pure philosophy than to seek to know the things that are. And honor and have reverence and appreciation for them. Now with that being said, In this little book, which is the first lesson, we invite our students to examine into the Hermetic teachings as set forth in the Kabbalion, as explained by ourselves, humble students of the teachings. So once again, none of us are masters here, not even the authors. Humble students is what we are, and we can all learn together. Once again, no master. We are on this journey together, and you probably know a lot more about this than I do, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just sharing it for those who have yet to even be introduced. And because I enjoy it, I'd be doing this anyway, and it's a lot funner to do it like this here with you so we can learn and go on this journey together. But with that being said, uh, we, as set forth in the Kabbalion and as explained by ourselves, humble students of the teachings, who, while bearing the title of initiates, are still students at the feet of Hermes, the Master, where we herein give you many of the maxims, the axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion accompanied by explanations and illustrations which we deem likely to render the teachings more easily comprehended by the modern student. Particularly, as the original text is purposefully veiled in obscure terms. The original maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion are printed herein in quotation marks, so it'll be um, my job while we go through this series to make sure I let us know when the quotation marks are used so we can understand the distinction between that which was used and that which was added. If that makes sense? That which was in the original, but I mean, that's hard to know. It's been you know lost to the centuries, ladies and gentlemen. But the proper credit, hopefully being given to those wise masters, our own work is printed in the regular way in the body of this book. We trust that the many students to whom we now offer this little work will derive as much benefit from the study of its pages as have many who have gone before. Treading the same path of mastery throughout the centuries that have passed since the times of Hermes Trismegistus, thrice greatest, the master of masters, the great great, in the words of the Kabbalion. Where fall the footsteps of the master? The ears of those ready for his teaching open wide. That is one of the original maxims, axioms from the Kabbalion. Here's another. When the ears of the student are ready to hear, then cometh the lips to fill them with wisdom. So that according to the teachings, the passage of this book to those ready for the instruction will attract the attention of such as are prepared to receive the teaching. And I'd like to make that disclaimer for this video. Is that According to the teachings, the passage of this information and this 
format of presenting the Hermetic philosophy, hopefully is to only those ready for the instruction and will attract only the attention of such as are prepared to receive the teaching or the entertainment of this kind. The philosophy, as I like to call it, spiritual philosophy. Ladies and gentlemen, the wisdom of the ages. And likewise, when the pupil is ready to receive the truth, then will this little book come to him or her. Such is the law, the hermetic principle of cause and effect in its aspect of the law of attraction will bring lips and ears together pupil and book in company so mote it be as our chapter ends there ladies and gentlemen i like the style in which the author um, puts some of his words together there very exciting ladies and gentlemen and that is a boom to the Hermetic Philosophy, Chapter 1 of the Kabbalion. Just getting us a taste of the origin of the Hermetic Philosophy. Is that what I'll call this video today? I'm not sure. I almost had the name earlier. I'm always unsure what to title these, but anyways... I'll think about that on my own time, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, chapter two, the seven hermetic principles. The seven hermetic principles. Mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, and gender. Ladies and gentlemen, the all is mind and the universe is mental. And we will begin diving into a description and a breakdown of the seven hermetic principles next week. I look forward to that. That is exciting, ladies and gentlemen. That is exciting. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, remember, if you want to get this book for yourself, put it on your shelf so you can follow along in the future. I really like how it how he put that there, how it's like that these teachings of this book to those ready for the instruction will attract the attention of such who are prepared to receive. And such is law. The, her the hermetic principle of cause and effect, I mean, we can't get around it. This is how reality functions. The knowledge of the things that are. And the functioning of reality creates this situation to where those who are ready, when the student is ready, teacher will appear. When you are ready, you will get the book for yourself to put it on your shelf so you can follow along or for reference in the future because we all need a little bit of hermetic philosophy in our lives, ladies and gentlemen. Also a link to my Etsy shop and my landscape paintings as well as C60, Purple Power, the ultimate anti antioxidant known to man. But remember, seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of ourselves and of reality and God, the things that are. And also remember to seek to discover the lost wisdom of the ages and the mysteries of our history. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, there is no way to happiness or enlightenment. It is the way. It is what we must bring to life, creating the ability within ourselves. And when we can do that, all the things we've been telling ourselves, oh, I'll be happy when I get there and have this much, and that's irrelevant because then we are there and the entire journey, hopefully, is wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here and joining me. The support means a lot. I really appreciate it that you would spend time here with me and all the wonderful authors and poets and mystics and philosophers and sages of the ages. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, be the change that you want to see. Be the example that you want to set. Na -na 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 -na.